Dr. Arthur James is an obstetrician, gynecologist, and pediatrician who has been involved in the care of underserved populations for the entirety of his medical career. In previous practices, he's been the medical director of a neighborhood health center, essentially an FQHC, medical director of Bronson Methodist Hospital's Women's Care Clinic, and founding medical director of Borges Medical Center's Women's Health Office. In each of these efforts, he has been instrumental in expanding services to indigent patients, patients using drugs, HIV positive pregnant patients, and to teens. He's also the founder and formal medical director of the Kalamazoo County Fetal and Infant Mortality Review Team, and for many, many years led the Kalamazoo County's community efforts to reduce infant mortality and reduce the incidence of teen pregnancy. As of July of 2011, he has been an associate professor of obstet obstetrics and gynecology and pediatrics at the Ohio State University Medical Center and Nationwide Children's Hospital, former co-director of the Ohio Better Birth Outcome, going, going through this, co-chair of the Ohio Collaborative to Prevent Infant Mortality and is a former senior policy advisor to the Ohio Department of Health regarding infant mortality. He's also a former member of the Health and Human Services Secretary's Advisory Committee on Infant Mortality and a former member of the Board of Directors for the National Healthy Start Association. He's currently a board member of the Centering Healthcare Institute and is co-chair for the Centers for Disease Control and March of Dimes Health Equity Workshop. So, as of May 2017, he's the interim executive director of the Ohio State University's Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Arthur James. Thank you all very much. Sometimes I have a tendency to be a little soft-spoken, so if you can't hear me, please let me know. I'm, <laughs> I don't know how to get any closer to this mic, Linda, but I'll try. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to be here with you this morning. I have a lot of stuff. I have a lot of stuff that I want to try to cover. Um, <clears throat> A lot of it's going to be data, so for those of you who are sitting in the back, I'm, I'm, you're, be, you're going to be straining your eyes a bit, but <clears throat> I'll try to get through things uh, in an orderly fashion here. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I've been crisscrossing the country over the last several years um, talking about this, this disparity that has been referred to um, already this morning and referring to it particularly where there's a difference in the opportunity for our babies to survive the first year of life is equity a dream deferred. So our goal is to make the case for why we think Ohio needs to eliminate the racial disparity in birth outcomes. The data that I'll show you will be Ohio data, not Dayton or Montgomery County data. I'm um, sorry, I'm having a tough time with this. I don't really have anything to disclose. There's not, <clears throat> I don't have any conflicts. <clears throat> By the end of the lecture, I hope that <clears throat> I'll help you understand the case for eliminating the disparity, what our history is in this state regarding the black-white disparity. Um, try to provide some appreciation for how past discriminatory practices contribute to the racial disparities that we experience. Um, and as has already been indicated, um, talk about the importance of addressing social determinants. So just to keep us on the same page, <clears throat> infant mortality is the death of any live-born baby prior to his or her first birthday. But within that definition, there's also this other stuff that makes infant mortality an important issue for us to address that it's the most sensitive index we possess for social well-being, that it's a community mirror. It tells us something about uh, ourselves. And internationally, it's recognized as a measure of a society's ability to provide food, housing, income, education, employment, and health care to its citizens. 
So let's start looking at some Ohio data. This slide goes from 1980 through 2015 and it looks at o Ohio's overall infant mortality rate. And to Ohio's credit, there's been a significant amount of, of improvement during that period of time, 44% improvement. Now if we disaggregate that line by black-white race, <clears throat> we see the black infant mortality rate here, the white infant mortality rate here, the spickled line or dots in the black line is because prior to 1990, the state of Ohio did not record race-specific infant mortality rates, so it was white or non-white. So for that first decade on this slide, it's a non-white rate that's part of the black rate. But I think that you can appreciate, <clears throat> oh, this just, just explains what I just said. I think you can appreciate that there's been a significant gap and it's persisted for a long period of time. The Secretary's Advisory Committee on Infant Mortality in 2013 said, our ability to prevent infant deaths and to address long-standing disparities in infant mortality rates between population groups is a barometer or a measure, if you will, of our society's commitment to the health and well-being of all women, children, and families. During this period of time, <clears throat> The gap in infant mortality in 1980 between whites and non-whites was that non-whites were dying at about two times the rate of whites. Fast forward to our most recent data and that <clears throat> disparity gap has increased. It's done that because the white infant mortality rate has improved at a faster pace than the black infant mortality rate. Now, <clears throat> During this same period of time, if we look at our disparity ratio between whites and blacks here in the state of Ohio, appreciate that one of our neighbors, Kentucky, has a disparity ratio that's significantly less than ours at 1.5. And so at some point you have to raise the question, you know, what, what, what is it that we're not doing here in Ohio? Why can Kentucky beat us in terms of this disparity issue? Another characteristic of this same data set that I want to make sure we understand is this whole thing about time lag. And part of the reason for that is because when we talk about the disparity in black-white infant mortality, we acknowledge the difference. And we generally will say in 2015, black babies in the state of Ohio died at 2.7 times the rate of white babies. And we move on. That's the end of the conversation. We acknowledge that there is this gap but that gap means more than just almost three times the rate of death between whites and blacks. So what do I mean by this survival gap? If you look at Ohio's black infant mortality rate in 2015, a death rate of 15 per 1,000 live black births, and then you look at Ohio's white infant mortality rate and try to find the last time in the state of Ohio that the white infant mortality rate was as high as 15. You have to go back well into the 70s. So what that means for us is that unless we change this trend, we are telling black people who live in the state of Ohio that our babies have to wait until the year 2055 to experience the same opportunity of surviving the first year of life as white babies did in 2015. We think that's wrong. We think that's unfair. And we know that we can do better. Another characteristic of this data set, same data set, I want to talk about is how we've done in terms of achieving our healthy people goals. I'm, I'm told this is a pretty much a health care, public health audience, so I'm assuming that everybody in here knows about healthy people. So in 1990, our goal was that by the time we got to 1990, our goal was to, that our white infant mortality rate would be no greater than nine, our black infant mortality rate would be no greater than 12. In the state of Ohio, we achieved that white infant mortality rate in 1987, several years in advance of the goal date. 
So as we look at this, this, is, this was the goal for white infant mortality, the Healthy People 1990 goal for black infant mortality, and this is when we achieved the overall infant mortality rate goal for whites in our state. For Healthy People 2000, the goal was that by the time we got to the year 2000, our overall infant mortality rate would be seven, depicted on this slide by point C. Our black infant mortality rate would be no greater than 11, depicted on this slide by point D. We achieved this overall infant mortality rate goal for whites, <clears throat> again, well in advance of the goal date. For healthy people, 2010, things changed. We decided rather than having two goals for different racial groups, that we would have one goal for everybody. And that goal was an aggressive goal, a goal of 4.5 by the time we got to 2010. Now, if you recall back then, our Surgeon General was, was David Satcher, and one of his big deals was that we needed to work on eliminating disparity. So that's why we ended up with one goal here. But as you can see, in the state of Ohio, we did not achieve that one goal of 4.5 deaths per 1,000 live births for whites or blacks. However, what was significant about 2010, never mind there. For Healthy People 2020, our goal is in part to eliminate disparities, to achieve health equity to improve health in all groups. And I point that out because a lot of times when I've talked about this, people tell me, you know, you're crazy. There's no way we're gonna eliminate disparities. Well, I'm pointing out that, you know, this comes from our federal government. This is what the nation says we ought to be working on. So <clears throat> our goal by the time we get to the year 2020 is for no group to have an infant mortality rate greater than six deaths per 1,000 live births. And in our state, we've essentially achieved that goal for whites in 2013, again, well in advance of the gold day. The state of Ohio has never achieved any healthy people infant mortality goal for black babies. Are you feeling me here? Yeah. Never. Not one. <clears throat> and if you look for this three year aggregate period of time of 2011 to 2013, for now we'll concentrate in the highlighted column here. This goes, this looks at infant mortality, highlighting the worst states, and then in green at the bottom, the best states in terms of rates. You can see that where black infant mortality is concerned for that three-year aggregate period of time, there were only two states in the United States who had rates worse than Ohio. The other thing to make note of on this chart is that for overall white, black, and Hispanic infant mortality, Ohio and Indiana are the only two states that are represented in the worst 10 in all four categories. That's us, us. And right now this is happening on our watch while we are responsible. And it's unacceptable. We have to do better. So in Ohio, <clears throat> what I suggest is that we've, we've developed a racially determined pattern for improvement for whether or not our babies get an opportunity to survive the first year of life. So I have those numbers on the bottom of the slide and just to go through a brief exercise. So if I say two, four, six, eight and ask you to give me the next number, you would say it's five, 10, 15, 20 and ask you to give me the next number, you would say and you can reliably predict what that next number is gonna be based on the behavior, the pattern, the association of the numbers preceding it. Think about that where infant mortality is concerned in this state by race. I've just shown you 36 years worth of data, 
36 years worth of data, that allows you to establish a pretty reliable trend for what's going to happen here in our state that defines us, that tells us that we have this differential level of concern, if you will, about babies being able to survive the first year of life by race. And we don't think that's right. Back in 2005, Dr. Satcher, along with some others, did this article where he said, what if we were equal? And he looked at the excess death rate um, for blacks compared to whites. I decided to do that where infant mortality is concerned in the state of Ohio. So if the question would be then, what if the black infant mortality rate, and here we're looking at 2015 data, what if the black infant mortality rate was the same as the white infant mortality rate? So that would mean that we would lower the black infant mortality rate from the 15.1 deaths per 1,000 live births to the 5.5 <coughs> that <coughs> white babies in our state experienced in 2015. What that would have meant during just that year, sorry I'm having so much trouble with this, is that we would have saved the lives of 234 black babies <coughs> in our state. Two out of every three black babies that died in the state of Ohio in 2015 would still be alive if we had achieved equity in terms of birth outcome. And if we had equity from 1990 through 2015, we would have saved the lives of nearly 6,000 black babies. There is this legal <clears throat> maxim that says that justice delayed is justice denied. Think about that for all of those black babies who were dead. Because there's nothing that we can do now. We've missed our opportunity to save those babies. We denied justice to them. But we can do better for subsequent generations and that's part of our burden, part of our goal, part of what we need to work on. So I think in this state, this question is legitimate. Do black babies in Ohio really matter? Or maybe the question should be, <clears throat> do, do they matter as much? One of the things my mother taught me, <clears throat> she pounded this lesson in my head over and over and over again, and it sounds strange as it reads, but she taught me to pay much, much more attention to what people do than to what they say. And so as we talk about this in answering that question, everybody says yes. Of course black babies matter. And yes, of course they matter as much. But I don't believe that our actions support that one bit in this state. And so the question for us is, how long are we going to accept this? How bad does it need to get before we're willing to change, before we're willing to make a difference where this stuff is concerned? One of the things that we don't talk about in this state, but that I believe is true, is that there are a lot of folks, including people in very powerful policy-making positions in our state, who don't believe that the black infant mortality rate can improve, or who believe that it is as bad as it is because of group level flaws amongst those of us who are black. And of course, if the problem is group level flaws amongst those of us who are black, then why work on trying to make this better? It would be a waste of resources for our state. The issue is that there's no science that suggests that group level flaws amongst black people are the cause for the high rate of black infant mortality or the disparity that exists. It's a lie that's told over and over in this state by what people do, not by what they say, that we need to debunk. It needs to be eliminated. We need to get rid of that <clears throat> because it's much too prominent a piece of things for us. So for those who think that black infant mortality can improve, I take you back again to Ohio data. 31% improvement during this 36 year period of time. 
And if the problem is because of something innate in us who are black, then why is it that at the same time the black infant mortality rate in the state of Ohio is 15, the black infant mortality rate in the state of Massachusetts is 6.9? More than two times better than the black infant mortality rate in our state. What is it about the geographical difference in the location of birth in the United States of America that ought to so significantly influence the opportunity of surviving the first year of life? If it's group level flaws amongst people who look like me, then are the people who look like me in the state of Ohio so substantially different from the people who look like me in the state of Massachusetts? We know that's not the case. And that a lot of what contributes to the significant disparities that we see and the high black infant mortality rate that we see in this state is because of policies, practices, systems that we put in place in this state that place some families at greater risk than others. And it's part of what has to change. You all just recently started a Healthy Start project here in, here in your community. <clears throat> One of the requirements to become a Healthy Start <clears throat> project is that your infant mortality rate for the catchment area that you're serving has to be at least one and a half times the national average. There are currently 100 Healthy Start sites throughout the United States. And in 2015, the cumulative Healthy Start infant mortality rate in the United States of America was five deaths per 1,000 live births. This is in locations where the rates were 15, 20, when people started those, those uh, projects. I show you this like I showed you that previous slide for Ohio data to prove once again that in fact these rates can get better, that, we, that they can improve. I also want to show you this. It looks at black and white infant mortality in the United States of America by decade, and it goes from 1950 to 2000. The purple bars are the white infant mortality rate, the black bars are the black infant mortality rate. And once again, you see this pattern where they both improve. Because the, and, and this line up here is the disparity ratio. Again, because the white infant mortality rate improves at a faster pace than the black infant mortality rate, the disparity ratio goes up. One exception on this slide was the 1960s to 1970s. And in my opinion, the biggest reason for that decrease in the disparity ratio during that decade was because of the passage of the Civil Rights Act. I point that out because often when we talk about improving infant mortality, and especially when we talk about improving the disparity, our conversation is almost exclusively about medical interventions. While the Civil Rights Act certainly included some medical things, it allowed some black people who, for example, in the South weren't allowed to go to the hospital to have a baby, to suddenly be able to go to the hospital to have a baby. It also addressed many of the social issues. And so I'm showing you this to, again, try to emphasize that it's not just a medical issue that we're trying to approve and address. So you see this decrease in disparity during that decade. <clears throat> when we talk about eliminating the gap, if we were applying it to these runners, what we're saying is that we want that runner who is behind to catch up to the runner who is in front. Now there are a lot of different ways we can do that. We can ask the runner who is in front to slow down so the runner who is behind can catch up. If we applied that to infant mortality, it would mean then that we would ask to no longer make improvement in white infant mortality until the black infant mortality could catch up to where the white infant mortality was. If we did that in the state of Ohio, it would mean that we did not improve white infant mortality in our state for 40 years 
till the black infant mortality could catch up to where the white infant mortality is. And that would be very unfair. It would be wrong. It would be unjust. That's not part of the formula that we're putting on the table. What we are saying very, very clearly is that we need to continue to go full court press at improving the opportunity for white babies to survive the first year of life. We need to do everything we can, no compromise in that effort, but simultaneously, we need to double, triple down where black infant mortality is concerned. And once again, I'm going to remind you, pay more attention to what people do than what they say, because all over this state, people have trouble applying that portion of this formula. The most egregious example in 2015 occurred in Lucas County in Toledo, where they struggled with both a high white and black infant mortality rate. They got a healthy start project the same time that you did. And in 2015, where we do everything the same for everybody instead of paying specific attention, more attention to the communities that are in the most trouble. In 2015 for Lucas County and Toledo, the white infant mortality rate, awesome, improved to 1.6 deaths per 1,000 live births. The black infant mortality rate at the same time went up to 16 deaths per 1,000 live births. So there was a disparity ratio of 10 during that year. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. Why I bring you back to what my mother said. Pay more attention to what people do than to what they say. So our goal then is to figure out how to get this guy who is behind to run faster to catch up to where the runner who is in front is. Now a lot of people say, well, you can't do that. So I show you this slide from the Center for Disease Control that looks at infant mortality by race from 2004 to through 20, I'm sorry, 2005 through 2014. And it shows that <clears throat> the black infant mortality rate improved during that 10 year period of time by 20%, the white infant mortality rate by 15%. That exact same thing that we have such a significant challenge for accomplishing here in the state of Ohio is being accomplished nationwide. And if almost every other state in this country can do this, then at some point in time, Ohio's got to get on that page. So Dr. Satcher, as I said, talked about one goal for infant mortality for 2010. And although our nation, our state never reached that goal, look at what happened nationally at the disparity ratio. It decreased as much or more as it did as a consequence of passage of the Civil Rights Act. This is hard work, it's complicated work, but it's not rocket science. We can do this. If everybody else can do it, then what's up with Ohio? And so part of the question then is why the disparity? What's going on? Why are these, there are these gaps? What is it about race that accounts for the, a difference in the opportunity of surviving the first year of life? Well, remember, first of all, that race is a social construct. It's not a biological construct. And I, that's important for all of us to understand. But it is especially important especially important for those of us who are black to get that and understand it because we hear so much data all the time about how we are at the bottom for graduation rates, pregnancy rates, STD rates, HIV rates, you name it, bad outcome rates. There's nothing biologically so substantially different about us that accounts for that. It's another one of those things that we have to debunk. And for those of you who are black, hear me very, very clearly. I often, in some of my talks, by making sure that those of us of color understand that 
You know, if I died right now and God gave me an opportunity to live my life all over again, I'd beg and I'd plead. to come back in the same skin I'm in. So part of the question is then, where do we go from here? What should we do? <clears throat> I think, you know, we talk a lot about <clears throat> health equity, we talk a lot about um, health equity and all policies, I think all of that's good. But I want to take the conversation back upstream just a little bit more. In my opinion, our conversation ought to be about achieving equity. That, uh, that ought to be our primary goal and then all else is derivative after that. But equity, in every phase of life that you can think of. Now, when I've had this conversation with some people, particularly economists, <clears throat> you know, part of what I get told is that, well, you know, we live in a capitalistic society and, and poverty is baked into the, into, the, into the formula. Capitalism also has exploitation baked into the formula, unfairness baked into the formula, and we control the degree of those differences. That's in our power. And when things get to the point that we accept as part of what we schedule that black babies die at almost three times the rate of white babies, then things have gone too far and we have to make a change. So if we look at the history for those of us who are black, <clears throat> although our ancestors arrived on the shore of America in advance of 1619, we came in large numbers starting in 1619. And of course, we were enslaved. 246 years of slavery, followed by 99 years of Jim Crowism. <clears throat> it's only been 53 years since passage of the Civil Rights Act. <clears throat> so put those two periods of time together, slavery and Jim Crow, and the kind of toxic stress that you know black people were exposed to during that period of time. Those two periods of time together to this date still account for 87% of the African-American experience. Now we will tell pregnant women today, if you're experiencing some stress, that the experience of that stress can compromise the outcome of your pregnancy. Not only that, but we tell people that the physiologic changes caused by that stress can be passed on to your fetus and that your baby can pass it on to subsequent generations. Well, if the experience of stress today can compromise the outcome of pregnancy, and it can be passed on to subsequent generations, then tell me what 350 years of toxic stress subjected on a group of people has done. And for us to compare blacks and whites today as if we've always been on a level playing field and never take this history into consideration is baloney. And we need to make sure people accept and understand that. So what we've done in this country is that we've created a lot of what I refer to as structural determinants, those policies, practices, and systems. And those things create the social determinants, the conditions in which we live. And those social determinants have consequences. So to try to make it simple, We've created some causes for the junk that we're experiencing. Here we see a slide, again, from this 10-year period of time of infant mortality throughout the United States, where African Americans have the highest rate, followed by <coughs> American Indians and Alaskans. Now, I show this slide because for the two groups in this country who have been subjected to the most unfairness, it's not an accident that they experience the highest infant mortality rates in this country. So, Ms. James, can you push that? Oh, she's gone, okay. So I'm supposed, this is supposed to show, just 
click that one time, Angela, the mouse. That's okay. This is supposed to show you this person erasing this whole thing that says disparities are natural. That's all right, you guys, I'm good. Because the point that I want you to get, I need you to advance the slide now. I'm sorry, it's not working up here. Maybe if I go back. Well, the point I want you to get in this is that these disparities are not natural. They're man-made. We made them this way. Hear me very, very clearly. We've created the circumstances that have resulted in black babies in the state of Ohio dying at some of the worst rates in the country, and we've created the circumstances that <clears throat> currently have black babies in our state dying at almost three times the rate of whites. So the real narrative here is, is that disparities are not just about a lack of access to care, that they're mostly the result of policy decisions and they especially affect populations of color and have been influenced by structural racism. Do I have any evidence that equity matters in terms of infant mortality? Another bar slide, this looks at Sweden in the purple or blue and infant mortality rates in Sweden by class compared to England and Wales. Sweden being a much more egalitarian country. And you can see that across the board, everybody's infant mortality rates improve. And if they can do it, What's up with us? Black folks have been knocking on this door for equity for a long, long, long time. I've just listed some of the things that have occurred during my lifetime. At some point, we got to get to the point that we're willing to turn this page. And this is a critical conversation for us, especially during these political times in our country. We've talked a little bit about the social determinants. Michael Marmot says our profession seeks not only to understand but also to improve things as some doctors and people in public health feel queasy about the prospect of social action to improve health, which smacks of social engineering. Yet a physician faced with a suffering patient has an obligation to make things better and if she sees 100 patients, the obligation extends to all of them. And if a society is making people sick, we have a duty to do what we can to improve the public health and to reduce public in inequalities in social groups where these are avoidable and hence uh, inequitable or unfair. He considers this a moral obligation, that it's a matter of social justice. When we look at our intervention strategies for improving infant mortality, we generally invest everything in the kitchen sink in the clinical outcomes. So in the clinical arena, and very little, relatively speaking, in the social or non-clinical arena. So in my opinion, this is the way um, our intervention strategy would be diagrammed. I personally think that the social stuff is at least as important as the clinical stuff. I also think that we make our best decisions in the area of overlap between the clinical and the non-clinical. And if I had to draw out figuratively how I think our intervention strategies ought to look, it would be like this. Because we don't live our lives in the doctor's office or in the presence of the nurse. We don't live our lives in the hospital. We live our lives in the community. Yet where we talk about infant mortality, <clears throat> we talk about it almost strictly in, in terms of medical terms. So babies die from prematurity, congenital anomaly, sudden unexpected infant death, those clinical terms. I'm suggesting that especially where we're talking about addressing disparities, I don't know why I'm having so much trouble with this, that we need to also figure out a way to address all of the stuff below the waterline in this slide. And that if we don't, then we'll never figure out what wrecked that boat in the first place. 
So according to the World Health Organization, inequities in health and avoidable health inequalities arise because of the circumstances in which people grow, live, work, and age, and the systems put in place to deal with illness. The conditions in which people live and die are in turn shaped by political, social, and economic forces. <clears throat> our intervention strategies today almost always <clears throat> look to try to assist people around through, under, whatever the obstacles are that are interfering with them achieving optimal outcomes. And I'm not knocking this. I think that this is important. And in pregnancy, it helps us um, to significantly improve outcomes. But in the case of pregnancy, after the pregnancy is over, we return that woman to the same circumstances that required our assistance and help in the first place. So this looks at an actual map for a family in Los Angeles and the various agencies based on the, that family circumstances that that family had to interact with. This is what those agencies did, not important for our conversation. What I want you to see is the map of engagement of those agencies in those families. And then once whatever those episodes were that the family needed help with, again, we returned them to the circumstances that required the help in the first place, that made them sick in the first place. And what a social determinant approach challenges us to do is to eliminate the obstacles, to get rid of the things for which so many agencies need to be providing so much help. I'm often asked, which social determinant then do we address? <clears throat> Reminds me of a conversation I had with my dentist uh, in Kalamazoo before I moved here who would say to me, you know, you know, Art, um, you, you, on, you only need to floss the teeth you want to keep. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the point is that we, we've got to address all of them. Now, we can't address all of them in most cases simultaneously. So you pick a place to start and you work on that and on-ramp others as you go along. I used to describe this as this being our intersection. High infant mortality rates, high disparities, we have some interventions we want to implement and we want to incorporate the social determinants in a life course kind of manner. I'm going to admit to you that this oversimplifies things. That our intersection probably looks more like this. And it gets to be intimidating. For some of us, intimidating enough that it chases us away from the work. But once you accept that to not be engaged is to allow babies to continue to die at unacceptably high rates, you have to stay engaged. You have to figure out a way to stay involved. <clears throat> what you are doing here, this meeting, and the kind of things that you've already talked about this morning are extremely important because place matters. Dayton, Montgomery County has to own this for Dayton and Montgomery County. As great as the Ohio Department of Health is and the Department of Medicaid, those folks in, Colum in Columbus are not going to come down here and save any of your babies. You have to save your babies. And the numbers, the numbers that were reported earlier for your community you have to own that because it tells a story about you. It doesn't say about Ohio. It tells a story about you. And if you think that's an accurate reflection of you, then so be it. But we know we can do better. So for all of those things that influence our health, every single one of them, the significant thing to accept is that they're all, if you will, nested in community so that we control them. You control them for this community. We also have to eliminate excuses. And we find tons of excuses. No excuses for 
babies dying at unacceptably high rates. No excuses for the disparity that exists. Relationships, particularly relationships with <clears throat> under-resourced communities is important. We have to get to the point that we accept that where black folks are concerned, we can't go in fixing the black community for the black community without engagement of the black community in that process. This, this, is, this is not a missionary thing where some folks have all the answers and know stuff and, and don't empower the community most adversely affected in the decision-making process and in the interventions. <clears throat> Big words, proportionate universalism or targeted universalism, but extremely important. We've actually talked about this a little bit already. But this, boy, this looks at infant mortality or risk factors uh, by socioeconomic status. So that um, the red bars are low, socio low socioeconomic status, the green middle socioeconomic status, the blue uh, higher socioeconomic status by the largest three counties in the state of Ohio. This particular one looks at preterm birth rate and this one over here at smoking and you can see that across the board People of lower socioeconomic status are more adversely affected than folks of higher socioeconomic status. But it's not a have and have not picture because people in the middle are also affected and they are affected more than the folks of higher socioeconomic status. We also see that same sort of pattern where low birth rate is concerned and of course where infant mortality is concerned. So let's switch the conversation a little bit. This graph looks at <clears throat> life expectancy by income, by socioeconomic status. So the lower one socioeconomic status is, the shorter their lifespan is. And if from a public health perspective, our goal was to improve this for the entire population, so we want this life expectancy to get closer to where this life expectancy is, think about what we talked about with the runners, then <clears throat> if that's our goal for the population, then our intervention strategies kind of need to look like that, where we apply a disproportionate amount of help to the folks who need the help the most, but that we don't leave anybody out of the help picture that we try to help everybody because on a population level, that's where we want to go. Now this is easier to talk about than it is to do, but that's the formula that we need to apply. This middle stuff is what I want you to hear, see from this slide. That action across all policy objectives is necessary across the social gradient with the scale and intensity, with the scale and intensity proportionate to the level of disadvantage. And I think all of you have seen this cartoon. This is what this cartoon is talking about. That we have to provide more assistance and help to the populations that need it most. Often this is our challenge. That when we talk about achieving equity, we don't acknowledge how much more assistance and help we've provided one group and the deep hole that we've dug for another. So that walking into this not appreciating the gravity of the issue. It's why that whole historical stuff is important so that when we compare people today and suggest that the playing field is level, that we acknowledge that that ain't the case. Life course, I'm gonna skip this because you all know all about life course. Dr. Lou has come up with a 12 point plan that he thinks <clears throat> will help us address that. It takes all of us. There's no single organization or group that can do this. It's going to be all hands on deck. There are matrices out there to help you figure out who should do what. <clears throat> I describe improving infant mortality as a relay marathon. This is not a sprint. It's going to take a while. And it, again, takes everybody on board. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get this to play. Can you click that to see if we can get this going? Nope, that's all right. <clears throat> Advocacy, 
extremely important. Pristine science, strong evidence by themselves are not enough. You gotta be willing to talk up about this in rooms and in places that it's uncomfortable to talk about this. You have to be willing to advocate to save our babies. It's not enough. And I wanna give you a couple of examples. <clears> the <throat> top line is the black infant mortality rate in Kalamazoo County where I was before I came here. The bottom line, the red line, is the white infant mortality rate. The time I moved to Kalamazoo, the state of Michigan had the highest black infant mortality rate in the United States, and within the state of Michigan, Kalamazoo County had the highest black infant mortality rate. So we got involved in a lot of different projects, a lot of things to try to improve the black infant mortality rate, including starting a Healthy Start project there. And this improvement that we accomplished in black infant mortality was actually during the, height, during the entire time of the cocaine, crack cocaine epidemic in this country, which as you all know, hit black communities harder than it did other communities and adversely influenced um, black infant mortality throughout this nation. But despite that, we were able to make those significant improvements in black infant mortality. And then our leadership changed. People in control, in the community decided that we, want, we needed to do things differently. I want you to understand when you look at that graph that the people that we were serving didn't change. They were the same. But we went from almost completely eliminating the disparity, becoming one of the few counties in the entire United States to achieve Healthy People 2000 goals for black babies to an elevated black infant mortality rate. At the same time, you note that the white infant mortality rate improved. We had proven that you could do it in Kalamazoo. This is what I mean by strong science, pristine evidence by themselves are not enough. Local example. Here in Ohio, we just recently, <clears throat> in February, released the State Health Improvement Plan for the state of Ohio. And as was mentioned to you earlier, we've decided in the state of Ohio that infant mortality is occurring at a crisis level. In February, when that State Health Improvement Plan came out, <clears throat> what the State Health Improvement Plan said was that by the time we get to the year 2022, we want to have a black infant mortality rate in the state of Ohio of 12.6 deaths per 1,000 live births. For all the time that it takes to develop a state health improvement plan, once you establish a goal, then you're talking about programs to put into place to allow you to achieve that goal. You're talking about the money and resources that need to go into doing that. It takes a long time to figure out how we're going to accomplish that goal. Now, the good thing about 12.6 deaths per 1,000 live births is that it means that between 2015 and 2022 that we're talking about improving the black infant mortality rate in the state of Ohio by 16% or about 2% per year. That 2% per year improvement would be significantly better than the 1.5% per year improvement that has gone on in the previous 10 years. The problem is that in the state of Ohio, today, or at least February of 2017, we're scheduling black babies to die in our state at a rate still higher than the nation was aspiring for black infant mortality back in 1990. Yet we want to suggest that the high rate is just because of group level flaws in people who look like me, that policies, practices, and systems don't matter. Advocacy is important. You can't just sit on this stuff, expect the science to carry us. <clears throat> so we confronted leadership in the state about this. Within two weeks, the goal changed from 12.6 to 6. But now remember all the time that it took in the planning and all of that stuff. I don't know that there's a budget 
and that their intervention strategies at the state level to help us accomplish six for black infant mortality by 2022. So again, where our advocacy gets to be important because at some point in time, people in this state have to be held accountable for this sort of stuff. And the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for us to do nothing. And then there's all this other stuff to improve infant mortality that you're gonna hear from, from other speakers that I've not tried to touch on. What we've tried to say in the Ohio Collaborative to Prevent Infant Mortality is that every baby in our state matters. White, black, yellow, brown, rich or poor, Republican, Democrat, from a right to life or pro-choice family, an immigrant or a citizen, somebody with a college education or not, drug user, alcohol drinking, it does not matter whether they're from the north, south, east, or west. What we have to help everybody understand is that any baby who takes his or her first breath within the borders of the state of Ohio is our responsibility and we have to do better. <laughs> I want to end by, with a brief mention about 2019. I mentioned that slavery in this country in a large way began in 1619. That means in less than a year and a half, the United States of America is going to have to, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, acknowledge the 400-year anniversary of slavery. Now, I think part of that needs to be that we figure out again how to turn this page because 400 years of this junk ought to be enough. So the subtitle of my presentation is Equity, a Dream Deferred. Langston Hughes says to us, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust over? a crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Rosa Parks was pissed off enough about having to sit in the back of a bus that she was willing to risk losing her job, helped in leading demonstrations which risked her life, yet today we can sit here where black babies are dying at almost three times the rate of white babies and we say nothing. It's too much. It has to stop and we have to figure out a way to make that happen. So for some of you who think this is too overwhelming and we it just, we can't pull this off. I try to remind people all the time that God doesn't just call the qualified, he qualifies those of us who he calls. And Nelson Mandela's life reminded us that it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you all very much. I hope uh, each of you are inspired today. And the message I got is, we need to turn up the volume to save babies' lives, right? Let's turn it up. <laughs> Dr. James, on, on behalf of Health Commissioner Jeff Cooper and myself, we want to thank you for coming out today. Um, the words that you gave us today are very inspiring and no, no amount of anything that we could give you will make up for what you gave us today. And you gave us life. We focus so much on infant mortality. We need to focus on infant vitality. Because death happens. If we change the language, let's stop talking about death and let's start talking about life. So all of you today are here to choose